We are facing a climate emergency. That's not news to anyone in this audience, I'm sure. And it's going to, an emergency requires an emergency response, not just a uh, sort of incremental uh, fix it around the edges kind of response. Um, and so, in that sense, I'm anxious about the future, like many other people. But I am hopeful too, and I'm hopeful in part because things have been happening that I couldn't see coming、uh, at all just a few years ago. Hi, everyone. I'm John. Welcome to my Active Towns channel, where I share a selection of my podcast conversations and video profiles of the promising efforts happening around the globe to create and promote a culture of activity. And that was Peter Norton, a distinguished associate professor at the University of Virginia, a noted historian of motordom, and the author of the classic best-selling book *Fighting Traffic*. In this episode, Peter and I discuss his new book, published by Island Press, *A Tonorama: The Illusory Promise of High-Tech Driving*, and the ultimate reality that wherever alternatives to driving have been attractive possibilities, people have taken advantage of them. To the benefit not just of the individual, but also community and society. Thank you so much for tuning in. It's always wonderful to have you along for the ride. I hope you enjoy it. It is an absolute pleasure to have back on the Active Towns podcast,、uh, Professor Peter Norton. Peter, welcome. John, it's great to be here. Well, hey, it's it's so wonderful to have you、uh, here on the Active Towns podcast in the video platform.、Uh, when when I had you on before, it was strictly an audio platform.、Uh, so it, it's it's great to have you here in the、uh, eCam Live Studio for Active Towns and、uh, getting something out on YouTube too. Yeah, well, Active Towns is a visual idea, so I'm glad you can do that now. Yes, no, you're you're absolutely right. I I totally agree. So let's have you do this、um, for those in the audience that may not be super familiar with who Peter Norton is. Why don't you do just a, a real brief introduction? So I'm Peter Norton.、Uh, I'm an associate professor of history in the Department of Engineering and Society at the University of Virginia, and I'm interested in streets and mobility and a. Future of more sustainable, inclusive, and healthful mobility. Fantastic! That's great. And uh, uh, your background、uh, as a historian—it's、um, it, fascinating in in that the way that it has manifested over the years. In two thousand eight, your 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 first was that your first book that came out? Yes, it、traffic? was.、Mm-hmm. Let's、uh, let's pull the image、uh, up of、uh, that that first book is is here. Fighting traffic, the dawn of the motor age, in the American city. What inspired you to sort of dive deep into this subject and inspired you to write that book? Well, beginning when I was a teenager, it began to seem to me that our towns in this country were strangely car dominated and. Like other people my age, I didn't drive, and I found that to be really debilitating to my life.、Uh, of course, growing up with it, I thought it was normal in a way. But as I got older and got interested in history, it started to appear to me that it had a, a special and a、uh, often disturbing history about how we got here. But I was always interested in the future too. I wanted a future with Less car dependency,、uh, greater、um, efficiency or sustainability, as we would say now. It's not a word I used when I was young.、Um, and、uh, more livability. And that's when I started to find out that that our history helps us explain how we got into this status quo. And I think understanding that history will help us get out of it. Yeah, fantastic. And we saw just a glimpse of your、uh, upcoming book,、uh, or the the book that has just come out, and it, it's it also is a historical piece in many ways, but、uh, it, it also then projects us into、uh, <laughs> the future. And、uh, and what's funny of this is is the the you know the 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 title of the book, Autonom Rama. And the illusionary promise of high-tech driving is 
just that it has been that you know illusory promise that keeps <laughs> keeps giving and giving and giving. So why don't you walk us through that the whole premise of this book because it does go back in in time and and walks us through sort of the uh, you know the dream if you will of uh, what driving can do for us. Yeah, it's it's a sales pitch and it's a sales pitch we've been getting for over 80 years. And sales pitches work when the salesman is credible and when the salesman finds a way to make the pitch credible. And of course, customers, and in this case, that means especially the American public, um, learns to be skeptical with time. But the uh, the selling of a, a car-dependent future that's attractive has been very inventive, and the people selling it have found clever ways to maintain credibility, even though they never really deliver what they promised us. So um, there's a there's a proverb everyone maybe it's probably everyone has heard of it. Uh, Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. Because you know we should know better. But I, I the book is arguing that we're being fooled the fourth time around, being sold this uh, utopian future where technology makes car dependency finally work. It, it, it won't make it work. Uh, it might be useful for certain practical uh, jobs, but it's not the all-purpose solution that, that's being sold to us. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and we can see in this particular image uh, that you passed along a, couple, a pair of images here, it's a snapshot into to, you know, a little bit of that, uh, that zeitgeist that was there. Now, in the book, you, you talk a little bit about how it's been manifested in a series of events and, and, and they're, they're basically Futurama events, which obviously is uh, a play on, or your, your, the title of this new book is sort of a play on Futurama. Uh, so let, let's, let's take a look at, at what we're talking about when we look at this concept of what we're trying to do or what the industry has been trying to do over these many, many decades of, of selling us this concept. So we'll go to Futurama 1. What is Futurama and what was this all about? So this, of course, uh, evokes the title of the book, which is Autonorama. And that, as you said, is a play on words. And one of the sources of that word is Futurama. And 80 years ago, more than 80 years ago, General Motors just realized that um, selling cars was more than just selling vehicles. If you wanted to sell a lot of cars, you could also sell a future where car dependency is very attractive and works everywhere. And whether it actually could ever work or not was never really the issue. The, 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 the task from General Motors' point of view was to present a imaginary future that at least appeared credible and that was attractive. And the picture on the screen right now shows General Motors exhibit at the World's Fair in New York of 1939 to 40 called Futurama. And they got the word by mixing future and diorama. So it's a gigantic diorama or model of the city of 20 years later. So the city of 1960. And it was very popular. It was a fascinating exhibit. Uh, you, you observed uh, acres of model unfolding beneath you as if you were viewing it from an airplane window. You were sitting in a moving chair, looking down as if from an airplane on the future. And the culminating scene was a city where uh, vehicles are whisking around everywhere, actually moving in little grooves on model streets with no traffic jams, no collisions, not even any parking because the little vehicles just reached the end of their track and then circled around the bottom of the street and came back on top again. So it was a really a, a dream city, and it was supposed to be the city that cars would deliver us thanks to technology, including, for example, divided highways, which you see in this, this picture of the model where um, 
uh, cement highways where we have overpasses and shoulders and median strips make it all safe and efficient. But, you know, actually building this city uh, delivered a quite different result. Um, in the, the next picture, you'll see a view of Portland. It's a, Portland, Oregon. It's about the same perspective. And it's after this was actually attempted. So on the left is the city of 1960 as General Motors asked Americans to imagine it in 1940. And on the right is the actual city of 1960, where, of course, if you funnel in that enormous volume of cars, they have to stop somewhere. And that's why you see Portland, Oregon, you know, one third of it recommitted to storing cars. So the, the reality could not live up to the promise, which is one reason why these shows had to be repeated. And they were repeated about every 25 years. Yeah, yeah. And what's, it, what is shocking about the, the, uh, the diagram or the model versus what was actually built is just that it's 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 so amazing to see how much of the built environment how much of the streetscape had to be dedicated towards uh, the storage of cars and so the surface parking lots really dominate because when you look at the model it's what dominates is is actually the 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 free flowing highway you know the utopia that that we <laughs> were being sold and and yet in in reality what you you end up with is is just what you're saying is you know having to have massive seas of parking so it, it's just it, that is very very shocking when you look at that and that's from a photo from 1962 that's right so it essentially is the future uh, that general motors was forecasting in terms of it being about 20 years after the model yeah yeah Interesting. Very, very interesting. And then we, we, we continue to, you know, kind of go along because there's other themes that come up, that come up. And, and one of the reoccurring themes whenever we're dealing with uh, uh, motor vehicles is the dreaded congestion. Congestion is, is the all evil. <laughs> Talk a little bit about that. Yeah. So, of course, a car is not a very spatially efficient way to move people, especially in crowded cities. That's pretty obvious. They typically have one, two, maybe three or four people at the most in them, and they take up the car itself, maybe 100 square feet. But then you have to have space behind it, space in front of it, and then you have to park it. So it takes an enormous amount of space. And even if you have a very high-tech car with a lot of high-tech equipment, the car still takes a lot of space to move a very small number of people. So the task among those businesses that wanted to sell cars and sell roads was to try to make the case that you could actually have a city where these vehicles could keep moving, uh, where you weren't stuck in traffic all day, where you could find parking when you wanted it and could afford the parking. Uh, ideally, it would be free parking, right? Um, so the companies, and that includes the Portland Cement Association, which made this ad um, in 1948, Portland Cement Association represented all the cement contractors. And so they naturally were uh, wanting to sell us highways. And one of the ways in which they sold them was as a cure for congestion. They also sold them as a cure for crashes, for accidents, a way to prevent them. But, uh, you know, once you put them through a city, um, then anybody whose destination in the city is going to need a place to park. And, and this means that uh, cities are caught between uh, either being clogged with cars that have no place to park or supplying all the parking by erasing all the real estate, including often communities where people live or work or play. So... Um, this, this advertisement is the promise. The reality, of course, is very different. And, and promise versus reality is a recurring theme in the book Autonorama. And it's cautioning us that we're getting the same kind of promises again, and we better be skeptical. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And uh, the, in this image, of course, we, we, we have the inevitable, you know, realm of the before and after uh, in, in Detroit. And yeah, when you're when you're trying to chase that cure of 
congestion mitigation and 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 solving for it, you you end up destroying what was the city <laughs> to create this. You really do. This is a heartbreaking comparison. These these photographs are just two and a half years apart. They show you the last days of Hastings Street, which was in the black part of Detroit, a neighborhood called Paradise Valley. And uh, two years later, it was completely destroyed to make room for the Chrysler Freeway. Belatedly, even the experts have recognized that this was a mistake and this segment of Chrysler Freeway's proposed to be removed and, and uh, a boulevard to replace it. But the damage has been done and this, this community was absolutely devastated. Um, and, you know, this being America, this also is a racial injustice story because the suburban commuters on the Chrysler Freeway came from segregated white-only suburbs, most of them, while then the community that was destroyed was mostly people who didn't own or drive cars, uh, but we're going to have to once their community was destroyed just to get to work. So it's, a, it's not only that the promise couldn't be fulfilled, it's also that pursuing the promise was very expensive and destructive and wasteful and harmful to people. And I think that's the same um, dilemma or the same trade-off we're facing today. Right, yeah. And uh, this obviously, you know, this harkens uh, and brings us back to uh, Jane Jacobs, of course, <laughs> and and notably, you know, in in New York City, you know, she was famous for having fought against the the ravages of a freeway going through her neighborhood, and it it, it is, you know. Talk, well, there's not a whole lot of success stories of of preventing this from happening, but there's a handful, and 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 this is is one of them. Talk a little bit about the relevance and the foresight that Jane had, uh, you know, way back in the in the '60s. So when Jane Jacobs published her book, Death and Life of Great American Cities, in 1961, it was a complete break with what all of the recognized bodies of experts were saying at that time, which is that, you know, big uh, projects to uh, redevelop cities, to make open space in them, to put in civic centers, to accommodate drivers, to give them parking, and so on, um, that she's, she, her argument was absolutely antithetical to that. And she says a, a city is a different kind of place. It's not a suburb. It's inherently dense. And its diversity and even its disorder are actually virtues. Um, you know, a city evolved. And so what appears to a planner to look like disorder is actually a lot of micro orders, if I can put it like that. And it was, and her book was a, a big, a controversial success, but a big success. And I wanted to be sure we mentioned it for the simple fact that uh, while people seem to recognize that today or in recent years, we um, recognize that the highway planning of the 50s and 60s was substantially a mistake. What we often forget is even people then recognized that it was a mistake. They were very controversial. Jane Jacobs was just the most vocal and the most recognized of many people who were really saying um, that these are a disaster and we should not be doing them. And this is one of the reasons why, you know, as Futurama 1's promise was failing, this means that the people who wanted to sell car dependency and sell roads and sell vehicles and sell fuel needed a second Futurama. In other words, a second way, a second uh, show to try to persuade us that, well, Futurama 1 didn't work, but maybe Futurama 2 can work. Yeah. If it doesn't work, let's try again. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And they had a way to make their new promise credible, right? So we're, we live in an age where we've gotten used to the latest technology making amazing things possible and sometimes really delivering them. You know, like, for example, Google Translate astonishes me that even though it's obviously not a perfect translator, it's far better than anything that was available just a decade ago. And so it's these kinds of amazing 
achievements that technology can deliver that can give people who want to sell us things a way to make their impossible visions seem credible. So in this era, the Jane Jacobs era, that was electronics, especially in the form of transistors. So, you know, this is before integrated circuits, but transistors were already amazing people with what they could do. Uh, you could, you were, we were beginning to see things like um, um, navigation of aircraft, like color television becoming a possibility. And even computers were um, beginning to impress people in a big way. And what made all this possible was transistors, hence uh, the electronic age. Uh, that's the title of RCA's magazine. And this is the way that you can make an impossible vision seem credible. All you need to do is find a way to connect it with this amazing thing, namely electronics. And that's what made Futurama 2 seem credible. Hey everyone, please stand by as we're about to address the magic of the transistor era. But first, I wanted to check in and simply say, if you're enjoying this conversation, please don't forget to hit that like button, leave a comment, consider sharing it, and of course, subscribing to the channel by hitting that button and bell right down there. Thank you so very much. These seemingly insignificant actions really do help me out a lot, and I'm truly honored to have you here. Okay, let's get right back into the action. And that brings up the, it's the beginning when you think of it. I mean, this is the 1960s that this is happening and suddenly it's, it's technology, it's science and, and, and promising something that, um, back in Futurama one in 1939, that was, that was a, it wasn't even talked about from a, from a technology perspective. I mean, it, it was just, it was the model. It was the build the infrastructure in, uh, somewhere out there was was the the magic that was going to happen, and so then the transistor age comes around, and suddenly that's the magic that that helps move this along, this narrative along, some twenty some odd years later. Exactly, I really appreciate you using the word magic because technology, when it's state of the art, seems like magic. Arthur C. Clarke, the uh, author of Two Thousand One: A Space Odyssey, among other things. Um, said that um, technology, when it's new and impressive, is indistinguishable from magic. And, you know, we've all had that experience of when, for example, we first uh, used a, an iPhone or, or first uh, did an online search, and it really did feel like magic. And that's what makes um, even the things that the technology can't deliver suddenly seem more credible. So, um, you know, this newspaper ad in 1961 is already promising electronic highways, um, jam-proof expressways with no crashes and no congestion, thanks to electronics in the form of transistors. Now, there's a really important distinction, which one is the technology really was and is extremely impressive and can do amazing things. And that's, that's not in question here at all. But there are things that that technology can't deliver, and one of them is a city where car dependency works. Right, right, and and that's a, an interesting factor too. Is that all of this is you know whether we're talking about this uh, electronic highway of the future or you know these other whiz bang things, and boy, they were desperate about trying to create. Uh, solutions and 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 the the links that they had to go to because the reality that we have today uh it, from our technology perspective is much much different from what the very rudimentary technology was then with of electronics and transistors and and the the application of using various batteries and and magnetic things and and all all this kind of stuff that they were trying to you know we take for granted now in our current uh, digital age, uh, but back then they were really working hard to try to do this. And so uh, it, it, it is interesting. Now, let's go to the fair. So this is Futurama 2 at this point? Exactly. Okay. Yeah. So they, General Motors did the same thing in the same place 25 years later and called it Futurama 2. That's their mm -hmm. name for this. Okay. 
Interesting. And, uh, and let's go to the fair future. And now we have an updated version of, of that model that we had before. That's right. In some ways it looks or it resembles the Futurama one in, in that it's dominated with these grade separated, divided, elevated highways. There are some interesting differences. One is there's this imprecise uh, invocation of electronics, uh, of transistors making this all possible. Electronics was invoked at Futurama 1 too, but uh, now it's the transistor age, so the electronics seems more impressive. Another significant difference is they really kind of fudged the parking issue in Futurama 1. And that was at a time when, you know, there was most people weren't commuting to work by car yet. And so the parking issue was avoidable. By Futurama 2, it wasn't avoidable. And so to make the city credible as a car dependent city, you see these gigantic parking skyscrapers, those two enormous structures on the left of the picture, are just to park cars. So there's a sort of tacit admission that parking is a major problem in a dense city, but somehow uh, enough parking skyscrapers will make this all work. Right, right. <laughs> I'm laughing because I, I see parking sky, sky, uh, skyscrapers around uh, the city today. <laughs> so there you go. So we're back to, to, to some of the fights uh, about, uh, you know, these expressways coming in. Right. So just like after Futurama 1, and especially after the Interstate Highway Act of 56, when there was an enormous amount of money to put these roads through cities, uh, well, there was controversy then, and then there was controversy again after Futurama 2. So on the right, you see a person I'm using to represent all of the opposition to highways. This is Alice Lipscomb protesting the Crosstown Expressway in Philadelphia in 1968. And incidentally, this was a success. She and her allies stopped this highway from going right through her community in Philadelphia. And on the left is the headline of the New York Times the day after the first Earth Day. And you see there Fifth Avenue, which was temporarily a pedestrian only zone just for Earth Day. And people really welcomed this. And so this is a sign that um, what General Motors was trying to sell, while quite attractive in a lot of respects to a lot of people, was not really taking to the degree to which General Motors and, and its allies wanted. I want to be clear, it's not just General Motors. that They, they tended to be the the easiest for me to use because they really appreciated the visual and they were very spectacular. But Ford was a big part of that World's Fair too, and so on. But uh, Earth Day represented a value that was arguing, you know, we maybe we don't want to pave everything, right? This was the era when E.F. Schumacher wrote Small is Beautiful, came out uh, 1973. And so people are asking themselves, um, what or questioning this vision that uh, the automotive interest groups and companies are trying to sell us. And this means, predictably at this point, that there's going to have to be a Futurama 3. <laughs> of course there is. Because <laughs> Futurama 2 wasn't, wasn't enough. <laughs> well, and, and as we, yeah, I was going to say, go and, 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 and now we start to see some new players in, in getting into this. And now we, this is an ad from Intel. Exactly. So just like after Futurama 1 failed, and it really did fail, uh, I mean, cars were accommodated to an extraordinary degree, but it was not the utopia that, that was promised. So after that failure, the companies that wanted to sell us this future had to invoke the magic of technology. In 1960, that meant the transistor. You couldn't keep making that same promise a decade later. There had to be something more impressive, more magical, newer, because the magic of transistors had faded. They were everyday things. And the magic was coming in the 70s through the microprocessor. Intel made the first. It's called the 4004. You can see them in the back of this picture. They were actually about the size of a thumbnail, but they've expanded them here. And... Um, uh, these integrated electronics, microprocessors, integrated circuits were supposed to deliver uh, a congestion-free, crash-free city 
just like transistors were supposed to do it. And it was credible because microprocessors really were astounding things. And people, by the 80s, they were starting to see these astounding things. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, and, and obviously with the, the microprocessors, you know, you know, getting going. And then in uh, 1984, I remember this computer <laughs> coming out. Um, yep. And so we're, we're, we're going headlong into a, a new era of, of complexity and, you know, and uh, just amazing stuff that you wouldn't have even imagined, you know, gosh, in 1939, in that first Futurama, you, you mentioned it earlier, the, there was some electronics, but it was very, very rudimentary. Then we get into the transistor age. Now we're into the microprocessor age. And this one wasn't actually named to Futurama 3, correct? Correct. But we dubbed it that, I, yeah. Yeah, I decided it it was worthy of the name. It had earned the name. So, Got it. But I should explain what I mean <laughs> by it. So, yeah, microprocessors became... Uh, among some other state-of-the-art technology, became the basis for new promises. This was the era where the term high-tech became ubiquitous. So yeah. high-tech this, high-tech that. And if you called something high-tech, you could really persuade people that it was impressive because the high-tech that was around was so impressive. So the Apple Macintosh, which was mine and a lot of people's first encounter with a computer we actually used, was just breathtaking. It was so small, but it was so easy to use with that mouse. It wasn't like the computers we'd seen before. Um, it was friendly. It, it seemed to have a kind of intelligence about it. And um, and then the military applications, too, be, were important. So um, 1990 to 91 was the Gulf War. And in in a strange way, the Gulf War became a free advertising spectacle for the electronics industry because the TV news showed us at the time uh, video footage taken from um, smart bombs approaching their targets, laser missiles that were very precise. They were actually only a very small fraction of the ordnance used. But it got a lot of attention and it really impressed people the way it could precisely destroy a small building or something like that and seemingly make war more tolerable because it wouldn't, uh, you know, hit a whole city or something like that. And so now that happened to happen 1990 to 91, just as the Cold War was ending. And so the companies making this expensive military electronics, those companies were very anxious that there would be a big drop in defense spending as the Cold War ended. And so as you can see in these ads, military contractors like Lockheed and Rockwell were promising to take their military technology and turn it against gridlock, turn it, turn it against crashes. Um, so, the, yeah, the, the text circled in red or underlined in red indicates that both of these companies, among others, were saying, you know, we have very expensive products, the military would pay for them, but now maybe the military won't. Um, ordinary people aren't going to buy these things. They're too expensive. So we'll sell them to the government this time as the anti-congestion, anti-crash technology of the 90s. Again, they never did call this Futurama 3, but they promised all of the same things. And General Motors was involved in a big way in this too, among other automakers and road builders and so on. What they tended to call it themselves was smart highways. And uh, so I'm, to me, Futurama 3 is the smart highways boondoggle of the 1990s. Yeah, yeah. And, and we've got in this uh, graphic here from 1990, uh, you know, we've got the satellite up there beaming down its information. And you've got the, the smart cars that are, that are out there as well and, uh, and the smart highway integration. It's strange, too, John, that the, the one place where they thought they could make this work best by sort of spacing vehicles closely together but safely thanks to all this technology was on the highways, which are actually, you know, the least congested part of any city. It's, this, it's the urban arterials and the city streets where these things really get crowded. Yeah. 
um, you, you can see the vision of packing cars close together, even when they're going, say, 50 or 60 miles an hour, with the notion that this will make much more efficient use of road space and thereby alleviate congestion. But as people pointed out, even then, this doesn't really solve anything because the moment they exit the highway to go to the office plaza, all of these cars are going to get backed up onto the road. Um, you know, in some ways, what you're seeing is the reinvention of the train, but the least <laughs> efficient train you've ever ridden on. Uh, this was called platooning. These cars were following magnets embedded in the road. Uh, the drivers didn't have to steer them. Um, and this demonstration in 1997 was presented as a, an amazing and astonishing achievement, but it was kind of a flop even then because the press quickly recognized th that this was a very expensive way to solve nothing. Yeah, yeah. By the time uh, Futurama 3 came around, the, the press was a little bit more onto it. And here's the guy uh, uh, demonstrating that he's not holding onto the steering wheel. Exactly. <laughs> Oh, my gosh. And yeah, here's another good uh, uh, image of the platooning effect. And that's it, right. It, it, it brings back memories of, of uh, the beginning of my career when I was having to, to, to drive on the freeway every morning uh, to get to my uh, place of work. And uh, as long as everything is going fine and, and everything is moving relatively smoothly, you do get into the rhythm of, of a platooning effect. And as long as there's no, oh, you know, a car tire in the middle of the lane or anything that, you know, is going to cause, you know, problems to your platoon, uh, you know, hopefully you're able to, you know, peel off, uh, you know, when you need to get to your exit or something along those lines. But yes, yeah. the dream, the dream. And so um, we, we, we see a different era and we see a, a different uh, realm here. And for those who, who may not be able to read the, the small print on this, this is Jeanette Sadek Khan. Uh, she was the transportation commissioner uh, in New York City during the Bloomberg administration. And uh, she and the administration, they pushed forward with transforming a big portion of uh, the built environment in New York City, uh, notably <laughs> the reimagining of, of Times Square, taking it away from uh, fast moving motor vehicle traffic and giving Times Square over to people, but also in, in putting in, uh, in, in, in bike lanes and, and trying to make uh, the city more hospitable to people outside of the motor vehicles. Uh, and this is in, in, in 2011 is, is when this uh, newspaper clipping is from, oh, the horror <laughs> to Futurama 3. I mean, this, this is about moving motor vehicles. Come on, Peter, what's going on? Yeah, so, you know, there's, the, there's a pattern here that after each Futurama, there's a, a skepticism that follows. Uh, for example, after Futurama 1, there was Jane Jacobs, Death and Life of Great American Cities. After Futurama 2, I know I used the example of Earth Day or of E.F. Schumacher's Small is Beautiful. And after Futurama 3, there was a similar sort of reaction that says, wait a minute, maybe we should be taking the opposite approach of, of making cities that are livable and, and where common sense everyday mobility works, like walking, cycling, and taking the bus. And Jeanette Sadek Khan stood for that vision. I'm, I'm very pleased, incidentally, that she wrote a, a blurb on the jacket of Autonorama. Now, when you have this kind of response, you, if you want to sell car dependency, then you, you, you have uh, your job cut out for you. But the, the thing that's going to make that job manageable is invoking the most impressive technology of your time. So by the 2000s, while microprocessors are still a big deal, we need, you know, the people selling us um, utopian visions are going to have to invoke more than that. So what we've been seeing invoked is, uh, you know, machine learning, networking, LIDAR, all of them incredibly impressive technologies. I'm not skeptical about how impressive those technologies are. I'm just arguing that they don't make car dependency work, right? Um, in 2007, you have the first iPhone and um, people first encountering these things 
had that magic experience that you alluded to earlier in, in the interview where technology starts to seem like it can do really anything. Uh, it's just that impressive. Um, this is also the era where the U.S. is getting involved in wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. And um, this means there's a lot of money going from the Pentagon, from the Defense Department, into high-tech ways of waging war with smaller um, standing human military forces. And that includes taking some of this technology and applying it in vehicles so that those vehicles don't have to have uh, human soldiers at risk in them. And so this is when we start to see um, uh, autonomous vehicles operating in deserts competing for prize money offered by the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, the DARPA Grand Challenges um, that Stanford won in 2005. And this in turn becomes the basis for promising us the car dependency in American cities, not just on, in the deserts of Iraq or on the mountain passes of Afghanistan, will finally work. Right, right. I'm going to go back to uh, the image here of, of Jeanette Sadat Khan and, and, and read the blurb that she has on the back of your uh, jacket here. Autonorama is a road switch for, human pow- for a human-powered age, showing that safer, more livable cities will be achieved not by the tech in our cars, but by our actions on our streets. And so that's an interesting take on that and and so very, very prescient because what we end up seeing is just how much of of, of a challenge that is. In fact, her book is called Street Fight. <laughs> and, and, mm-hmm. and it is a, a, a battle, uh, you know, to, to try to make these changes. And to your point, you've said it several times now of the car dependency. Each of these future Ramas, and now as we're getting into the Atanarama era here, is a form of car dependency. Talk a little bit about that, because that's a, a key question that you pose in the last sections of the book, is that that might be the wrong question to be posing. <laughs> Do we want status quo uh, car right. dependency or high tech car dependency? Yeah, the, the struggle for the people who have had businesses that are profitable because of selling cars, selling equipment, selling roads, and selling all the stuff that goes with these things, uh, for them, car dependency has been a huge win. And so their struggle is to make car dependency credible as a as something that can work and um, not just as a, a practical tool that we can use because that's a small market uh, a special purpose tool has a limited market um, if you can sell the car as the all-purpose transport necessity that everybody needs to do almost anything then your market is far bigger and the paradox of car dependency is, if you live in car dependency, then the car really is liberating. In other words, without it, you don't have freedom. But then the question becomes, what is your real um, obstacle? What is your real situation? Is it that your car is liberating you or are you living in an environment where it is so constructed around the assumption that you will have a car that you've been deprived of all of your other choices, which is sort of the opposite of liberating. So uh, what's liberating is what gives us choices. And in a car dependent setting, we really have no uh, choices. And I think uh, the autonomous vehicle fantasies that were being sold are attempts to claim that technology can make car dependency work well uh, without crashes, without congestion, even without emissions, um, carbon dioxide emissions. But, uh, you know, it, it it doesn't add up. Right, right. And that brings us to to, to the, uh, the zero crashes, zero emissions, and zero congestion uh, promises that are coming out here. And, uh, uh, and uh, again, that's, it was summarized here in this uh, 2017 General Motors uh, document. And, 
but at the same time, as you just mentioned, it, it's just a high tech version of car dependency. Yeah, the, the beautiful thing about this 2017 report from the CEO of General Motors um, is that they're quite obviously selling things that can never be reached. In other words, we'll never get, at least not in a car dependent world, even with the best technology, we'll never get to zero crashes, zero emissions, and zero congestion. And the, the genius of this is that fact is not a bug, it's a feature, because if you cannot get to the destination, then there is unlimited consumption between where we are now and where that des destination is. Uh, a really um, ingenious man at General Motors back in 1929, he was the number two man there named Charles Kettering. He said back in 1929 that the secret to business success is, and I quote, to keep the consumer dissatisfied um, because a dissatisfied consumer can always be promised that satisfaction will come with the next purchase and on an individual level that can take the form of say the latest model car but on a societal level that can take the form of a future with zero crashes zero emissions and zero congestion which keeps us permanently dissatisfied with the status quo and therefore willing to spend unlimited money to, to get to this ever distant destination. The, the experts say, and I'm, I'm depending on them for this estimate, that about a hundred billion dollars have been spent toward the autonomous vehicle future that so far has delivered almost nothing to us. You can get uh, a Waymo ride in suburban Phoenix, um, but uh, you know, it's painful to me to think about what that $100 billion might have achieved if it had been spent on common sense mobility. Right. Yeah. And that brings us, uh, and, and obviously that 2017 was uh, in, in after the this particular um, thing from 2010, and and we're, we're dubbing this the Futurama 4, and of course we're, we're in now wholly into the uh, Autonorama age. Uh, at, at this point and and the promises of of this future now no peter seriously you got to tell me what is it you have against the future it's here <laughs> uh well it's interesting because if you went to the it went to futurama one as you left the exhibit they gave you a button and the button said i have seen the future mm -hmm. and what really makes that seem creepy to me is that it, they're saying it is the future, i.e. there is one future, right. it is General Motors' future, and you get to see it, but you're no, you don't get to uh, participate in imagining it. And so what I have against the future is what I have against packaged futures that are presented to us without asking us what we want. And so I'm actually a huge fan of the future, provided it's the future that we get to choose from among alternatives and we haven't had that chance yeah yeah and and that kind of brings us around to one of the uh i'm just i'm skipping through some of these because they're so so amazing um one of the the things i i gotta love look at this i mean so this is 1957 and 1974 and then the the, the 2010 Wow. To me, I, I put these pictures together because they're pretty much the same, same thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? The top is Futurama 4. And again, it's never been called Futurama 4 in any official way, but right. it's obviously an appropriate name. Uh, and I think uh, we could call Futurama 4 Autonorama. So that's right. you know because of autonomous. That, that gives us the book title. Now, that top long panel is from a film that General Motors and its Chinese partner – the Shanghai Automotive Industries Corporation put together at, at Expo 2010 in Shanghai, and it was purporting to show the city of 20 years in the future, this time Shanghai. So mm -hmm. really, General Motors is doing exactly the same thing they did in 1939, showing the future, showing the city of 20 years into the future. So this is the city of 2030, because the Expo was in 2010. Mm -hmm. So we're more than halfway to this 
supposed destination. And I have to add that that top long panel from that expo is supposed to be a carbon neutral future delivered by a combination of windmills and cars that somehow work on photosynthesis. I'm not kidding, like plants. Um, and it is also a totally car dependent future. Everybody's going everywhere, literally everywhere by cars and they're all being automatically parked. So it, it's, I think, sort of obviously impossible. And that ought to make us ask, well, why would they even want to depict a future that's so impossible? And I think that's exactly what we've been dealing with since 1939. We've been getting sold futures that are impossible, but they're packaged for us and made attractive and investor interest is um, spurred. No one ever really expects that these things will deliver all it's promised, but they have um, this tendency to divert our attention from the things we already have that are inexpensive and that work. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, (laughs) it's more, more of, of these graphics that just make you going. And the, the terminology, I'll pause at at this one and let you comment on, on, on this, uh, just a moment, but the terminology that, you know, that we see there with, there's a, an acceptance or an, at least an acknowledgement that our roadways, our communities need to be safer. And so, you know, you saw it on that, that previous, uh, you know, slide there that the, the word safer. And so, I mean, we're on track for a, another 40,000 uh, motor vehicle crash fatalities here in, in the United States. Um, I don't know the, the global numbers. I think it's nearly a million or more every year um, on, on the, the global roadways. So clearly it's a system that doesn't really work that well in, in, in when you look at the casualty rates. Well, the horror of that death rate, you know, which reaches a lot of personal families, uh, and if you throw in the the, the serious injuries and so on, yep. uh, it reaches almost everybody, um, has the strange effect of actually giving the people selling us futuristic car dependency a better way to sell it. They can right. actually claim, as they have been doing for over a decade, they've been promising that actually this is what will finally deliver for some years they were promising zero crashes in fact officially general motors is still saying that's where they're taking us it's it's if you look at the analyses and how they arrive at these things it doesn't add up it's fair, fairly obvious uh, fudging of the numbers in the sense that for example they say an autonomous vehicle won't have all the failings that a human driver has right and, but then they don't add in all the failings that a robotic driver has. And it turns out robotic drivers have a lot of failings too, right? There's things humans are better at than robots and things robots are better at than us. And then there are things that we're actually both fairly bad at. And this is why robotic vehicles are certainly not on course to be safer, at least not unless they go so slow that nobody would want to ride in them or unless they be limited to places that are already rebuilt around car dependency, like suburban Phoenix. So the, um, the technology can really make things safer. Uh, the, the experts are pretty convinced that some emergency braking systems can really help people out uh, in a car, given car dependency. But what the technology can't do is erase this problem. Uh, it's, it's, they don't. The people selling this future don't talk about it, but the things that really have been shown to make roads and streets safer are prioritizing pedestrians and cyclists. And once you do that, then you really have a safer world, as has been demonstrated, for example, in the Netherlands. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And uh, <laughs> we we start to see uh, again the the side by side comparison here in the carlton reed's uh, article on on bicycles and bus- buses dominating the future that's that side of 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 the vision of what the future will be and then of course the future it, it 
agenda of of imagining the future of of car dependency, but now it's autonomous vehicles. That's right. And, you know, the futures we're being sold, purportedly they're about solving our mobility needs or meeting our mobility needs. But as the, the picture on the right indicates, uh, it's really largely about creating a market for some very expensive hardware, software, and infrastructure. Um, because if that's the future, we're in trouble because there's no way that future on the right is a uh, low carbon future. Even if everything's electrified, that is a lot of power and that power has to be generated. And if we want, say, wind and solar to supply of all of our needs, then we're going to have to find a way to have less, not more, uh, energy intensive uh, transport. And that's why um, these experts that were studied in 2020 by the German Federal Foreign Office agreed that the path toward low carbon uh, transport ultimately has to prioritize, especially on the passenger transport side, it has to prioritize walking, cycling, and transit, which is relatively boring and also doesn't come with as many things to sell to people and to governments as autonomous vehicles do. Yeah. It's uh, rather than autonomous vehicles, let's have autonomous people. <laughs> I wanted to I wanted to fast forward to, to this slide from uh, uh, from Mark Wagenberg uh, with Bicycle Dutch. Uh, he just posted this and it, it's a wonderful look back at one of his most popular videos that he had ever produced. And he went through and redid it, brought it and updated a great deal. But it was interesting because it retells that story dating all the way back, uh, you know, in history and some critical moments that, uh, that the Netherlands went through, uh, in the 1970s. And so it was a theme that, you know, that you brought up with the first Earth Day here in the United States and, um, and, and a different future. And you and I have both spent a fair amount of time in the Netherlands and, um, it, it really is a, a system that works on so many different levels. Um, you, you really truly do have autonomous people. You have the ability to, to get around, but it's not as if, uh, you know, they haven't banned cars. I mean, cars are there. In fact, the, the you know, the, the, uh, another wonderful video that was just produced uh, by Jason Slaughter with Not Just Bikes was about the happiness level and satisfaction level of the Dutch drivers because they're just incre- it's a it's a system that works for everybody because there's choice. Talk a little bit about that. Choice is a really key word. It's interesting to me that um, in this country which tends to celebrate free freedom of choice uh one of the places where it's most conspicuously absent is in what your options are for getting to a a destination i i wanted to make sure that we fit into this conversation uh a message about what can work because i obviously have spent a lot of time talking about what hasn't worked or won't work and what can work um much more than we've tended to appreciate in this country is low-tech, everyday, common-sense mobility. Tech has its place in that, too, because tech can help it all work together. It can make sure that when your train arrives at the destination, there's a bike ready that you can then use the card that you use to ride the train. You can use to get a bike. That takes technology. But um, the Netherlands offers us uh, a number of, of good lessons. One of them you pointed out, which is that giving people good choices does not necessarily mean um, making driving, uh, you know, sort of punishing it. Um, There's an app called Waze owned by Google that where drivers evaluate their driving experience and the Netherlands has had the highest uh, evaluation there for that. Um, But what was really important in the Netherlands also was a sort of people power movement where people demanded something better. Um, And with that fact in mind, I think it's important that the the audiences know that Americans have had such people power movements as well. 
So the picture on the right shows uh, a sort of popular demonstration in, in Amsterdam in 1972 where people are demanding safe streets and they're, they're determined to bring attention to this problem and they are therefore illegally blocking the street to call attention to their demand that streets be safe for children, for pedestrians, that cyclists have places to cycle. And um, what I think we need to remember in this country is that all over America, in cities large and small, and even in suburbs, similar protests happened a generation earlier. So 20 years before that Amsterdam demonstration, we have this one you see on the left by mothers in Philadelphia demanding safer streets because from their point of view, their children have a right to the street. Now, we've sort of surrendered that right since this picture was taken. But what we have here is a, um, an indication that we do have a history in this country of people demanding safer streets for their kids. And I have pictures like the one on the left for many American cities and suburbs. Um, and there, there is this tradition that I think we can reconnect with. And I think it helps us question the predominant explanation of car domination in this country, which is that it was the popular preference, that it's car culture, that it was consumer choice. All of that, of course, was to an extent true, but what it neglects is important. And what it neglects is the fact that even in car-loving America, there was a long tradition of people, especially mothers, demanding that their streets be safe for themselves and for their kids. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, in the book, you talk a little bit about uh, the need for reframing the question. And, you know, it's it, you literally say, let's ask what future we want and then talk about the tech that we need to get there. You know, if you go to the doctor and you demand from the doctor a certain drug, the, a good doctor is going to say, well, now hold on, let me, let's do a checkup, let me check your symptoms, tell me how you've been feeling and so on, what have you been eating and so things like that. And then the doctor can know what to prescribe for your condition. But when it comes to our transportation, uh, we tend to have been getting it backwards. In other words, um, people are coming to us saying, here's the drug. Uh, you need to take this drug and it will solve your problems. And I feel like saying, well, in the hang on, why don't you ask us what we think our problems are? Why don't you ask us what really we would prefer to have? Why don't you give us a vivid menu of alternatives that we can peruse through so that we can choose instead of having this choice made for us in advance? Right. Yeah. So, You've been out on the road, getting the getting this book, uh, you know, out out to folks. Now, I, I'm assuming you've been out on the road. Have you actually literally been out on the road? Has it mostly been uh, Zoom types of uh, presentations? I have not traveled for this book. Okay. It's all been online. Okay, uh, I've had some nice online conversations, and this is one of them. But I have not, um, I've not been on the road. Okay, so. You've been talking about this book and you've been getting out there. And by the way, this is a, a, a tonorama. The Illusory Promise of High Tech Driving is published by Island Press. So you've been talking it up and, 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 and having wonderful uh, interviews. What have you noticed and, and, and what has it left you with, you know, doing this whole book launch process? Um, what impressions have left you with in terms of your uh, level of uh, hope and, uh, and, and, and level of excitement for the future based on what you've been hearing? Well, you know, we are facing a climate emergency. That's not news to anyone in this audience, I'm sure. And it's going to, an emergency requires an emergency response, not just a uh, sort of incremental, uh, fix it around the edges kind of response. Um, and so in that sense, I'm anxious about the future like many other people, but I am hopeful too. And I'm hopeful in part because things have been happening that I couldn't see coming. 
uh, at all just a few years ago. So you mentioned my first book, um, Fighting Traffic, which came out in 2008. And at the time, I just didn't see much advocacy for, uh, you know, the the kind of uh, advocacy that, for example, Active Town stands for, uh, or that uh, we see in cities all over America, or I wasn't acquainted yet with the fine work that the that NACTO does, National Association of City Transportation Officials. Or uh, at that point, uh, Jen Netsana Khan hadn't done her extraordinary work in New York City. And these trends have really accelerated. I could see traces of them in 2008, but now they're ubiquitous. And just as uh, uh, the Netherlands was at, in danger of becoming car dominated in the 60s, and by the 80s, it was really had really turned a corner. And um, that gives me hope that these corners can be turned. Yes, we live in a polarized country, but on the other hand, the places where we have the most opportunity for improvement are also the places that tended to be the most open to uh, the kinds of changes that need to be made. So um, I have some cautious optimism that the people power we need uh, and the um, questioning of the status quo that we need for a common sense, sustainable, inclusive, affordable future um, may just be uh, delivering. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. And, uh, it, and it occurs to me, too, that it's nice to have a, uh, a growing number of cities that we can point towards that are making massive uh, uh, changes towards becoming more people oriented. And again, uh, really exemplifying, making sure that the audience knows that we're not talking about just uh, getting away with motor vehicles and, and banning cars. I mean, these are cities that are actually doing a really good job of facilitating choice. And so there, you, you do have that ability to, to walk and bike and use public transit and, yes, even drive. Uh, you know, so you've got the, the, the Paris's of the world that are, you know, taking bold steps to move forward. Uh, and of course, you've got, you know, the, the cities in the Netherlands, too many to, to name, that are just extraordinary. Um, obviously, Utrecht and, 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 and Amsterdam, too, the, the, the most well-known, but also Groningen and Delft and many others. Uh, but then also you, you've got Copenhagen and you've got uh, cities like Oslo and Norway that are making good uh, strides. Here in North America, you've got Montreal and Vancouver that are doing things. And then right here in my home city of, of Austin, Texas, we're, we're working hard to make it easier for people to be able to get around without that car dependency. And so I, I'm with you. I'm, I'm hopeful that, you know, based on what we have been seeing over the last decade, especially, uh, that we're heading in the right direction. However, I do feel that there needs to be a little bit more of a sense of urgency because, as you mentioned, the climate challenge that, that is facing us is such that uh, we can't rely on technology to try to solve this. Uh, some of what is most impressive about these other cities is that it is a good combination of high tech and low tech solutions mm -hmm. and about creating places that are people oriented, livable places. So that would be my That's closing right. I, thoughts. I, yeah. I, I really uh, agree with you on that. And I appreciate the point you're making that this is not about depriving people of cars, which can be useful tools. Um, it's just that we can't have car dependency. That's the thing we can't afford. And I also appreciate your point about how technology, including high-tech, state-of-the-art stuff, has its place. It's just a question of us figuring out what it can best do for us. And and going back to that question that, that you posed is like, what is the future that we want? What is the city that we want? And then how can mm -hmm. we have that combination of low-tech and high-tech tools to be able to achieve that? Good stuff. Right. Peter, it was absolutely a joy to have you once again on the Active Towns podcast. Thank you so much. John, it was a great honor to be included here today. Thank you. Thank you all so much for watching this episode featuring Peter Norton. I hope you'll consider picking up his amazing books, Fighting Traffic and Otanorama. And please don't forget to like, subscribe, drop me a comment, and check out this next video. 
Oh, and if you'd like to go the extra mile, please consider supporting my mission to create a culture of activity for all ages and abilities by pledging a few bucks each month on Patreon or making a donation to the nonprofit. Details below in the description and in the show notes. Well, that's all for now. But until next time, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers.